Hello and welcome to episode 006 of Brand Awareness. I am starting over for a second time because there was a big ass fly in my room. There's only a few things, um, by the way, I'm Brenda Weischer, your host. Welcome to this episode. Um, there's only a few things that scare me when it comes to insects. Not scary, but you know, the really, really big flies, like fat, that just like you wonder physics wise how they hold up um I had I just had that in the room for I was speaking for 10 minutes and then she came back and I was like this is not the vibe because I kept like ducking for the fly and I also thought you could hear her we're good now um how is everyone we took a little break a little breather because I was on another podcast last week and I wanted to give that some space and to be honest, I was also tired, you know, I'm just a girl who's sometimes tired. I know that one of the worst types of people besides terrorists is the person that complains about jet lag because it's so obnoxious, like we get it, you travel. But I'm a very tired girl this morning and then I put on the neon lights above me. I don't know if you're watching this on video. They're very bright, so I'm squinting. It's like a whole situation. but. Um, so just be aware, I might be a little bit slow. And as you know, this um, podcast is never edited. So there might be a few like long breathing pauses. Anyways, I wrote a little notes thing that I have in front of me, but I don't really know if I actually want to talk about any of these things. I am in Berlin since I think maybe two days. Mm. And I want to have a whole week at home. I don't know if that's actually working out. I'm leaving for Paris next Friday for a bachelorette's weekend. Um, that is my first bachelorette's that I'm ever attending because none of in Germany that isn't really a thing. Like we don't really have bridesmaids or any of that when someone's getting married. I don't want to generalize, but slowly but surely these like, I think they're Amer American traditions, right? these like I mean everything's getting commercialized so we like slowly there's like bachelorette's weekend and like all of this stuff so I have a bachelorette's weekend in Paris next week and then it's my man's birthday the Monday after and I'm flying to Rome which I'm super excited for I haven't been since pre-pandemic and I love myself some Rome just not in the summer it is end of May so it might still be fine um yeah I'm very happy to be home whenever I travel Berlin is really like my safe space. I've been here for, I think like 12 years. I moved here in 2012, right after school. I graduated and moved here without a real plan of what I was doing. And then like a year later, I started studying. I was just working before, or not, maybe not a year later, like six months. Um, and I've been here, yeah, on and off 12 years. This is my like Kreuzberg. Mitte, Kreuzberg, Neukölln, Mitte. This is my fourth apartment in 12 years. I think that's kind of fine. We don't move around that. Again, maybe I'm generalizing. You don't move around as much as you would like in New York, like every year, because most of our contracts are unlimited when it comes to time and people can't really increase your rent by that much. So most people tend to stay in their apartments for a while. So I'm living in my fourth apartment and, um, Besides, I moved to London in between and New York, but I always kind of came, came back. I can do a whole episode on Berlin. I feel like it's so popular to say like, I love Berlin, I love Berghain. Um, I think Berlin, much like any big city, you can have a lot of different lives within the city. Like, oh, I'm really trying to turn, I'm turn it down a notch when it comes to my filler word, like it's, it's getting so bad. Um, you can have a lot of different lives in Berlin. I think every borough is completely different. You can have your chic life in the West. You can have your posh Mitte life. You can have your Neukölln life. You can, I don't know, you can have your Friedrichshain life if you really want that. But, you know, um, so I've had lots of different lives here too. I've had my like four years of Berghain phase, like every weekend. I think at some point I was already kind of sober and was like parking my car outside of the club and driving home at 7 a.m. I've had that. I've also had different friendship circles and people have come and moved away. And I think, I mean, now I'm really sidetracking, but I used to think, for example, when I was younger, that keeping your friends from high school or from childhood, that that meant you're loyal 
well, that you're stable, that you're a good person. And I was looking at people who were changing friend groups or changing friends pretty often, that they were maybe two-sided or they couldn't keep friends or like things like that. I thought it had a ne very negative connotation. And now years later, I've moved on from so many friendship groups and partly that is growth you know we're not always on the same path doesn't mean I'm growing and they're not just maybe I'm growing slower also um, or um, developing my character and often it was really lifestyle especially come like mid-20s in Berlin I think there's at some point a pretty big divide because in oh my god I'm really losing my English between the people who really will keep the party lifestyle and the people who don't you know in Berlin um, you could really it was so cheap that you could kind of get by with like a job in retail or a bar and still go out every other day because it was pretty the living cost here is still compared to other big cities like us it's still pretty low so at some point yeah in the mid-20s I have I've had friendship groups where um, they kept partying and it was no longer really like my lifestyle. So slowly but surely I found like a little group of friends who we all kind of have a similar view on life and what we want to do and what the perfect weekend looks like. Um, so I no longer believe that you always have to stick with the same kind of friends because growth is never like this linear path and everyone has a different pace and um, I've had a few friendships end over the years and not even a dramatic thing but just things were no longer fitting and I also like I don't want to support this like protect my peace era that is very toxic because I think a lot of people especially on TikTok it's like wh whoever no longer fits your life you have to cut them out you have to cut them out I don't believe in that either so I don't, it's not something that's not something I want to promote here but I've had I don't know why I'm even talking about this. But yeah, so my life in Berlin, whenever I say to someone that doesn't know me when I'm abroad, like I live in Berlin, they automatically assume like, oh my God, she's in Bergheim every day and it's doing ketamine and all of this crazy stuff. And I have a very wholesome life in Berlin. My friends and I go on walks <laughs> and sometimes we go out, but often the craziest thing we do is like go to a restaurant where you stay for a long time like until 1 or 2 a.m and that is it and that was a wild night for us so I think whenever you say Berlin people assume the craziest things and um, yeah my life is not really like that here and I've heard of people being like worried like I want to move to Berlin but I don't know if it's too crazy for me I think with self-control and the right kind of network you can live in most cities and um, live a healthy-ish life you know that also doesn't mean I'm no longer friends with the people who are like go out every night they are also still my friends it's more about like boundaries but yeah I've been on and off here for 12 years and it really is my safe space I am also German so I speak the language ich spreche Deutsch. Um, and I've gotten questions whether or not you can live here without speaking the language you definitely can um, I think, oh my God, Summer's coming and crying with her ball. Come here. I don't think you can see her from the corner of the camera. <laughs> She's so emo. Um, whether or not you have to speak English when you move to Berlin. Um, I don't want to generalize and say you should speak the language. I certainly would. Okay, I'm shutting her out. You gotta go. Um, I would want to learn a bit of the language if I moved to another country. But I don't, you know, that's not... Yeah to each their own. Germans in Berlin are very excited. As soon as there's one person in the group that doesn't speak German, everyone's like, we're sw switching to English. So I have dinners of eight people and there's one person that doesn't speak German, the whole table, even at the end of the table where that person is, isn't even involved in the conversation, we speak English, we're like so excited. And I think that isn't usually the case. I don't know if I'm with Italian people or French people, um, everyone's constantly switching back to their own language and that is fine it's not something that I would do personally but yeah you can definitely get by here with speaking English only but with a little bit of effort at least you can make like polite conversation um, but German is very hard uh, it has the cost of living that I brought up I think compared to other big cities it's still affordable um, I would not have been able to afford to like buy an apartment anywhere else for example however it is expensive like 
it is expensive now. I think cost of living has increased everywhere. Um, your supermarket purchases for one person that used to be 40 euros is now like 80, you know. I, I have the same experience that everyone else has. You go to the supermarket, you fill your cart with like five things and it's 50 euros. So that is that, but I love being here. It's my quiet place. I have um, like an hour in the park every morning with Summer, my dog, and I have space and I feel really fortunate to be able to live here. Um, I got another question about Summer, my dog, and I don't know, I, I've, my Instagram questions are open since a few weeks and I've seen a lot of like, how do you travel with the dog? Um, is it the right time for me to get a dog? I don't feel comfortable answering that question for anyone that I don't know. I waited for a long, 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 long time before I got a dog. I think getting a dog is usually a selfish decision, right? Like I want someone to love me. I want something to do. I want a dog to exercise. I want whatever. I want attention. Um, and my decision was also kind of selfish, but I waited for a long time. I wanted a dog in university. I wanted a dog in my other university. And I always knew it wasn't the right time and right, right space. Um, if I didn't have a dog right now with my current lifestyle, I also wouldn't get one because it is restricting. Um, summer is kind of the priority of my life. You know, I made the decision to be responsible for this living being. So I'm trying my best to take care of her in the best possible way. Um, when I made the decision to get a dog, I would always obviously say adopt on shop and Summer is not adopted. I want to be quite open about this. Um, I could have also tried a lot longer to adopt a dog, but it was my selfless de decision to get one like right now. So I only tried for about two months in shelters. Um, it was during COVID times. Um, I don't really have to justify myself either, but like I have nothing, you know, to like prove to anyone. So I went to shelters and the only dogs for, for two months that they offered me were um, dogs with breathing problems, pugs and a few other breeds. And I just I cannot handle that, like seeing them suffer every day and Fren French Frenchies. Um, I love pugs and Frenchies, but that was not, I cannot do with the breathing problems. And then... Well, yeah, I really wanted a small dog so that in emergencies I can fly with him. You're in Europe within most airlines, except for um, cheap airlines, they don't fly dogs ever, not even service animals, like nothing, because it would disrupt their whole like system. Um, so you cannot bring a dog onto EasyJet or Ryanair here. Um, so I wanted a small dog that can fly with me in emergencies because I was projecting like my future life and I knew I wanted to travel and have my work attached to travel. Um, and the other small dog breed they offered me were Jack Russell Terriers, who I grew up with one and they're a lot and they're back. I mean, you can train any dog, but it wasn't it wasn't for me this like hyperactive thing. Now I have the most hyperactive dog in hindsight. So who's laughing? The Jack Russell Terrier. Um, and the other breed was a Chihuahua. And I love Chihuahuas. I think they're one of the best breeds ever. Um, they need a lot of exercise actually which people don't know I feel like however I wanted a dog that's a little bit bigger because I wanted a dog that can like go on hikes like kind of like a hybrid in between anyway so nothing really worked out in the shelters and yes I should have tried a lot longer I think but I really wanted a dog like right the second and then people kind of knew I was looking and then randomly I got a message from someone like a friend of a friend of a friend um, of a poodle mix which is summer um, that was reserved for a year from this like small breeder that has like one set of puppies every year and they were like this dog was reserved but she was born and sorry I'm not laughing I am laughing this dog was born and the family that had reserved her wanted a blonde puppy and Summer was black so they were just like that's not our vibe and I didn't even see a picture of her I was like yes immediately and then I drove um, and saw her when she was six weeks and then a few weeks later I picked her up and yeah she's a poodle mix she's super intelligent she does that because poodles are very, very smart. So I hope that no one ever gets a poodle because of what they look on someone's Instagram. I know Summer is so cute, but she demands a lot of time and a lot of training. And I have to say as much as I love animals, unless it's a adopted dog with huge trauma, 
I hate when people bring their untrained dog, untrained dog, like anywhere, a dog that's barking in the restaurant, a dog that's like not behaving, not sitting down. So Summer, I really pride myself and I trained her really well. I also grew up, with, uh, grew up with dogs, so she listens to me. She has her crazy moments, but she is very obedient. She, you know, I, I don't know if you see like Instagram pictures of me and Summer. She's constantly looking at me because she's constantly looking for a cue, like what do I want her to do? So she is really well trained and she has at least two hours of exercise, but she was a day in the park. Um, it looks like I'm like flying her all over and she's attending fashion week. But even during fashion week, if I bring her, she's my priority. And I think you have to be really ready for this kind of responsibility, you know, and she doesn't fly with me often. It's more either for emergencies because I couldn't find someone and then she's coming with me. I took her to America for the second time and I would only do that if I'm going for an extended period of time. You know, I was there for a month, so she's coming with me. She's really good on the flight. She doesn't do anything, doesn't bark. She just sleeps in her bag. Um, and sometimes I bring her to Paris. It's a one hour flight. She's really well behaved. And if I'm bringing her during fashion week, I have like one show a day where someone's watching her and she's with me at all times. I never bring her to loud spaces I never you know like when I see someone I'm really judging that but like to each their own but if they bring their dog to like a fashion event like a cocktail and it's like super loud and the dog is like so stressed out like I wouldn't do that to summer I would leave any place or event where I feel like this is not the right space for her she's never in a space where people smoke she's not, like I'm really um helicopter mom when it comes to her and I have to say she's the kind of breed that loves both sides. I feel like she's thriving in both um, nature. She's obsessed, but also she loves going into a store, saying hi to all the employees, like rubbing herself on the carpet. So I feel like she's always a joy to be around and she's happy um, whenever she gets to come with me to anything. I have to say I rarely see her stress unless it's like really loud noises. And yeah, she's. For me personally, um, it was the right time when I got her because I felt responsibly ready to take on, you know, being responsible for someone's, like for a, a being's, well, for someone's well-being. I don't know if I can, can call a dog someone. Um, she is, you know, the first thing I wake when I, I do when I wake up is I take her on a walk and it's the nicest thing also for my mental health because I'm not on my phone and I just wake up and I have something to do, especially as a freelancer. You sometimes don't know how your day is starting and mine is starting with the dog and I'm in the park and I'm in fresh air and to me it's really, it does wonders. And she's giving me a routine. Summer is getting fed twice a day during the same time and I don't know, it just, it gives me... I, the responsibility is kind of the pillars to my life and how I structure my things. Um, but yeah, she was just with me in New York and then in Florence and she was the best ever and such a joy. And yeah, so just so you know, my dog is really the priority here, even though I make it seem like, oh, she's flying all over the place. Like she's always the most important thing of whatever is going on if she's with me. And if I don't have her, there's... <laughs> A few of my friends who have like a waiting list in Berlin of who gets to watch her and then I have someone else in the countryside sometimes watching her and um, yeah that is that um yeah so I'm back home from New York I feel like people were expecting a Met Gala review podcast from me uh maybe that's also why I pushed the podcast a little bit that is not something like the red carpet there is not something that really interests me to this extent I also think it's getting more and more mm, boring every year not in a bad way it's just like that's expected it's a commercial event right um, what interests me is I don't want to sound like a snob here what interests me is the exhibition itself you know I got invited to the press preview for the second time so Met Gala I'm pretty sure most people are aware now but the Met Gala is a benefit dinner and plus red carpet for the Costume Institute of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So any big museum has several departments, right? For, responsible for whatever, for whatever category. And the Costume Institute, it's fashion. So dating back to a few hundred years, maybe that, I don't know how old the oldest piece in that collection is. I think the Costume Institute owns over 30,000 pieces, I think. Um, it is a self-funded department to my knowledge. So 
that's often also because fashion is not seen as art, but we can get into that another time. Um, so it is a self-funded department and the, that means it relies on, um, it relies on external money, um, donations mostly. So the, there's several exhibitions a year and the Met Gala dinner is for the spring exhibition of the Costume Institute, Costume Institute of the Metropolitan Design Art. Oh my God, I'm really like, this is big words for me. So this is a night that raises money, A, for the next exhibition, but also it's their main source of income for the Costume Institute. So they're paying wages from this. Um, this is money that allows them to do a new exhibition, to acquire new pieces, to care for these pieces, you know, fashion items that are like, valuable and 100 years old they cannot just be stored like a t-shirt on a hanger like this is a very expensive thing to do and it's their responsibility to archive these things and take care of them and it's a really expensive endeavor i know that the met gala usually raises between like 15 and 20 million i think so just you know as like also don't trust anything i say on here this is like information just that's just like swimming around in my head i have no idea if that's true um so the main money maker of that dinner is donations and people or companies buying tables or seats. They all get kind of approved by Vogue. Anna Winter is the one you can hate on her as much as you want, but she's really like the money maker for the Costume Institute. Um, so there, I don't know how many tables are at this dinner, but someone like Amazon will buy a table. The table, I do think everyone gets a different price, you know, for some people she might make it cheaper and then for others she doesn't. I one time heard that the table is 300k, but maybe that's increased, maybe it's decreased. Also, I'm sure there's different sizes of tables. So for example, Amazon is buying a table, maybe there's 10 seats, maybe 20, maybe, maybe five, I have no idea. Um, they get to bring whoever they want to bring. It is approved by Anna, I'm assuming. And then Anna, if you're a very commercial client like Amazon, she will also give you at least one independent designer to be at that table. And maybe they also get to get a, get to bring a guest that they will dress. For designers and brands, I think Balenciaga, for example, bought a table and then they will also, they get to bring um, celebrities. Often they're also paired and approved by Anna Winter who they are dressing. So it's not only buying the table, but it's also making a dress for, I don't know, Nicole Kidman that can be several hundred K. Like this is very expensive for these brands. And for some brands, it used to be their biggest means of communication. I think, I feel like it was like this for Moschino by Jeremy Scott, for example. I don't think they were no longer there also because they have a new creative director. So that's no longer like their endeavor, the Met Gala. But it is, it is a really, really big money maker. Um, I think some people, like I also say it's the Super Bowl of fashion, but in some regards it isn't. And I don't want to like downplay or hate on the Met Gala. But for example, for actresses, this is not their most important um, day of the year. Even though they might have a fabulous red carpet moment, um, this is not a make it or break it um, deal breaker in their career. That is, you know, the Oscars, like that is being Oscar nominated, like that changes your entire career. You will forever be Oscar nominated, but walking the Met Gala red carpet is not the craziest thing. And I am assuming that for a lot of celebrities or guests, it is a really stressful red carpet because it's not like a step and repeat, you know, like a movie premiere, but it's, st it's steps. You're getting photographed from all angles. You don't get to bring your boyfriend or publicist. Usually you are a plus one of a designer of a brand. So you're on, on this carpet alone. And I'm assuming it is a really, really stressful thing to do. So yeah, there's brands buying um, tables. Then there is a lot of big donors. I think Tory Burch is a big donor, for example, um, and just like socialized private people, rich people in general. I think there's two angles. It's either I want to buy myself access to culture, right? Like to be attached to art, or I have a lot of money and I want to support something I believe in, art and culture and fashion and archiving fashion and seeing fashion as an art. So I think there's a lot of different reasons to be attached to this thing. I, from, an, from a very arrogant lens, you know, also with the TikTok sponsorship this year, I think for really, really big 
Hollywood A-list celebrities, it is not the most attractive thing to do anymore because from an arrogant point of view, you know, there's like influencers on the carpet. You know, I'm myself as an influencer. I think I can say this in this shady way. They don't want to be attached to a crowd that isn't necessarily beneficial for them. So I don't think, unless you're under contract, it is like the big moment for them anymore and not as attractive. Um, yeah, the big money maker for celebrities. I'm not sure if anyone actually gets paid to be there. Also because the dresses the brands make for them are very expensive. I know the big money maker is usually jewelry, you know, like the Bulgari contract, the Tiffany contract, the whatever contract. But that might also be part of that celebrity's yearly contract, you know, public appearances. So, yeah, it is what I'm mostly interested in. You know, we took I took a walk um at town in the night it was happening and you saw in front of the hotels all the stylists hair and makeup hair makeup assistants and photograph photographers sorry it is such a universe of people who make money on that night so i think that is very very fascinating um usually when a brand dresses a celebrity often the celebrity is in power you know, it's uh, maybe the dress for the Oscars or whatever. Um, the, the celebrity gets to choose the designer they want to wear with their stylist, obviously, and gets to have a say. But Met Gala is completely switched around. The celebrity, uh, the brand kind of chooses you because they're paying for everything. And it's like, here's what you're wearing. And I think that is often also the result why we as watchers think, oh, that person looks really uncomfortable. I think often whoever we're seeing on the red, carp red carpet, pink carpet, whatever carpet the Met Gala is that year, the reason why we often think like, oh, they look kind of uncomfortable or not as confident, it's because the designer completely had the power or the brand to dress them. And often the designer, uh, the celebrity, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm really confusing my words here, trying to explain this thing. Often the celebrity doesn't get a single say, even if they're really big, it is... Um, Michael Kors, I'm just saying like random example, Michael Kors, buys the table, dresses you, this is what you're wearing, it's an honor for you to go or it's a big exposure for, moment for you to go. So the celebrity within fittings isn't going to be like, ah, oh, I don't like that color. So that is why often we're like, that doesn't seem like such a good fit because often even the celebrity doesn't know the designer or has never worked with them. It's like a random matchmaking from Anna Winter sometimes. I'm not saying this in like a negative way, but that is why you don't often feel like these people are friends or this is like an organic thing. Um, I don't know if you guys want me to talk about any looks. I, I don't know. Obviously, I also am curious to see what's happening with John Gaiano because I am sure that Magella or OTB did not buy a table. I mean, maybe they did. OTB is only the brave, the um, head company of Renzo Russell that owns Gisanda, Mani, Diesel, uh, what else? And Magella. I think there's like... One or two more. Anyways, um, Magella had a really big moment and the dresses that they chose were very John Galliano self-referential. So I'm also assuming, is this as big as it gets for John and Magella and is he going somewhere else? I think it would be very surprising if he actually chooses to go to an LVMH house after everything that happened. Maybe he is getting investment to start his own brand again. I don't know if his own brand is dead or like sleeping the John Galliano brand but um, I do think it's it was a weird that he got the some of the biggest celebrities on the carpet and I don't think Magella bought a table and it, it seemed very Anna Winter orchestrated so I don't think she's doing that just for shits and giggles I'm thinking there has to be some kind of annou announcement in the next um, year I feel like anyways um, yeah, so I am mostly interested in the business behind it all and like who has a contract with who and who has which jewelry contract, who's styled by who. I think this is very, very fascinating. Um, the exhibition itself, Sleeping Beauties, I wrote a little text for Vogue for the exhibition. If you can read German, it's on Vogue Germany. Um, I thought it was great. I, the pieces they chose were amazing. It's like very immersive, their smell, their sound. I saw the Alexander Music McQueen shell dress, which was so iconic. Lots of Iris von Herpen dresses. Um, 
yeah, I think it's if you're I don't actually know until when the exhibition is. Sometimes it's until September and sometimes it's shorter. But if you're in New York this summer, I would highly recommend going. It's really, really beautiful to see. And also as a fashion person to see fashion up close and seeing fashion um, treated as art. Uh, yeah, so I can really recommend going to see it. What else? I've gotten a lot of questions on when am I doing the strategy episode and I feel like now I hyped it up so much that I'm, I think it's too much pressure for me to do a whole episode. So I feel like what if I just slowly in every episode snuck in a little bit of strategy because my whole life is strategy. So trying to fit that into one episode, I feel like isn't really, I don't know. I was thinking, yeah, after I have a little story on where I just went for a brand trip. And after that, I might talk a little bit about gifting. Anyway, so I left New York and um, I flew to Florence with Dior. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned Dior on my on this podcast already, but Dior belongs to LVMH, obviously. It's Maria Grazia doing women's and Kim Jones doing men's. And Dior, House of Dior is the first major, major, big LVMH brand that paid me any attention. So for me, um, it's a... I've always been a Dior fan, but it's a really special connection for me because they picked me up when I was still seen as, I don't know if I was seen as problematic, but a little bit too risky. Like, what will she say about the show? Will she wear any of the stuff? I was a little bit too unpredictable for brands and also not big enough. And Dior was the first house that invited me. And it was also my first um, couture show. I think I mentioned that maybe in the second episode of Brand Awareness. Uh, and they invited me a few weeks ago to come to Florence and got my flights from New York to, to Italy. Mm, I don't really do cruise shows um, and I don't really do brand trips. I can get into that in a longer episode, but brand trips, it sounds very fabulous, but it's still work. And even though you're in the most expensive hotel and everything's amazing, I don't want to sound ungrateful here, but you're still kind of sometimes mixed with, you know, whenever I get invited somewhere and I ask for the group or my management asks for the group, you're sometimes mixed with the most, like, with people you've never seen. And even though I'm a social person, sometimes I honestly would rather give this seat to someone else because I want to be home. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I, I don't really do cruise shows and these things are not vacation. I think I travel by myself. I think for the girls that have like the Instagram partner, boyfriend, you even though you're working during the day on these trips, you still get to have the five star hotel with your partner in the end and can have like go to the spa and do all of these things. But I'm by myself usually. So it doesn't really feel like a vacation to me. Um, but yeah, when I got the invite, for my first high jewelry show, I'll explain what this is in a minute, I instantly said yes, because this is one of the most exclusive events um, that a brand can do. So how do I get into this? The big luxury brands, usually you say 2% of the customers represent around 40% of the revenue. So just let that sink in. So basically, if you are a girl, a woman who is buying like three, three K handbags on my Teresa of YSL. They don't care about you. They don't care about me either. I buy no bags. Um, who these brands really cater to is this very, very small percentage of clients who are spending numbers that you and I cannot even fathom. So there's old couture, obviously for these brands, which means custom tailored, um, outfits that often only exist one time. Like if you buy a haute couture dress, this house sometimes only has two items, one for their own archive and one that you get as the haute couture client. And sometimes only you get it. I'm really not an expert on haute couture, but this can be like a 500 K dress. Like these things are expensive as fuck. And these clients don't just buy one a year. So what we as kind of like fashion interested people see is the ready to wear shows and sometimes we see the haute couture shows and we think these are like the main events 
of the year. But not only does a house like Dior have like 15 shows a year, there is events that we will never see. So there are small tier events like a store event, you know, a, I don't know, a boutique in New York is catering to their VIC, very important client customers and, and inviting like 50 of them for a little cocktail to preview the collection. Like this is like the tiniest event. Then it goes bigger, oops, then it goes bigger and bigger than that. Um, there's trips for VICs, there's private appointments, there's private, private anything and we usually don't get to see that. So high jewelry is well like the name says very 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 expensive jewels um i don't know the prices of these things but i know of one vic that one time spent 20 million on a single high jewelry dior buying appointment so it's wild these numbers so when i got invited i was super excited because this is like a very secret world that i really really wanted to see and it's a huge honor um, so the high jewelry show was in Florence and I think there was, we counted, at the, I tried to count at the dinner, I think there was only like 100 people there. Um, maybe of these were 20 press and then we were three talents. So it's like really, really tiny and really exclusive. So basically what happens is you're getting flown in and for the VICs, I'm not sure if they fly themselves with a private jet and some I think get flown by the brand, I, re I think it really depends. Um, you go there and it is the most luxe experience you can imagine like the fanciest hotel but not just fancy but like you go I went into my room and there's a gift and there's like three different cards from the hotel and from the um from the brand and someone's hosting you so I'm, I'm not really used to this level of attentiveness if that makes sense so there's a schedule and there's like a private we went to a museum and saw like Michelangelo's David David um, in person the museum was completely shut down at night like it is the most luxe experiences you can imagine and very tailored to the crowd and um, there was an amazing dinner in Florence at night and after the dinner for the 100 guests it was a fashion show in this like beautiful courtyard and um, Maria Grazia made specifically made haute couture pieces for the jewelry pieces and it was the most magical show I have to say I've, I've seen in a while and the models for, I don't know if it's the case, as I said, it's my first time doing this stuff, if it's always the case, but the models were, they looked so proud, you know, to be wearing these jewels and walked around slowly and were like posing. If you're watching the video, you can see me pose right now, kind of in slow motion. It felt very like old school vibe and there was eye contact mm. and yeah, the show was very magical. I was really touched and I, I'm not usually in the room with like crazy jewelry like this. And after the show, there's a party and another cocktail. And then the next day, I mean, it's really, this is like so beyond what I could have imagined how much money these people are spending. Um, the day after we went to a lunch and meanwhile, as we're having lunch, these clients were making their buying appointments and there was a presentation of the jewels that we saw the night before and they all had stickers next to them like in an art exhibit which meant they're already sold and I don't know if there's pieces where they only make one of one sometimes it's maybe like four of them are available mm, I cannot imagine the prices but I'm thinking it's at least six figures and probably high six figures and sometimes into the millions that's depending on the stone um, so the type of money that these people are spending there is really, yeah, no, it's something that I, I couldn't really fathom. And I have to say, I sometimes when I see the VICs that are ready to wear a show, like Louis Vuitton, for example, those are the people that like buy a hundred of the sneakers a year. And it, sometimes it can also be like pretty tacky and flashy. And when I saw these Dior clients, the VVVVVICs, one thing about Dior by Maria Grazia, I know that a lot of like high fashion and high fashion Twitter, everyone's hating on her Dior. These ladies were so fucking chic. They were wearing their Lady Dior, sometimes whatever special edition, tailored suits, suit pants, blazers. It was giving like Grace Kelly. I have to say that I, cause I, in my own judgy mind, I was like, ooh, these people are gonna look crazy. And I was really, 
really, really impressed with how chic and elegant these ladies were. I was also, you know, VICs is like my whole Roman empire, so curious how they would all interact with each other. And I think it's a mix of some of them are friends, but also there's always like a little bit of a competition going on, like who's getting the best piece. So I think it's probably a little bit secretive as well between them. But yeah, these brands, these high luxury brands, there are so many events that we as the public, and I'm like pretty close already in capital F fashion inner circles, but there's so many events and things that we have no idea about. And the brands do pretty much everything in their power to entertain these people and to keep them loyal. So the service is like very extravagant. The destinations are always beautiful. So they're really trying their best to keep these VICs entertained. And they also have to give them a reason to wear the clothes, right? So it's like the, I don't know, Chanel show happens and then it's the buying appointments. And, but it's the buying appointments for the next show. Like, what are you wearing for our next event? That's, this is what you have to like get dressed up for. And I think it's a mix of people who A, the tiny portion of people is trying to like, quote unquote, buy their way in, right? Like buy their way to be attached to culture, to be attached to a designer, to be attached to whatever is happening. And I think a lot of them, it's simply, you know, people love to judge what other people are spending their money on. And yes, maybe they could all put their money into saving the world, but this is not what they choose to do. A lot of them are really fans, like mega fans of fashion, and they look very appreciative, at least from what I was able to gather of this art form that is haute couture and fashion and high jewelry. So yeah, it was really, really fascinating for me to go and see that. Um, I had no, I was invited as influencer or press. I actually, I'm not sure I had no deliverables. So it's not like fly me in and I'm posting. I posted whatever I wanted to. Also with this, you know, I talk about whatever I wanted to. So there was really a no strings attached policy for me, but also I decided to share as well on my broadcast, the Instagram broadcast. Um, I just, I shared a lot of behind the scenes because I think this is something that most of us really never get to see. So it was really exciting for me. Yeah. Speaking of no deliverables, strategy and gifting. I think um, gifting is one of the things I can talk about. Mm. I said in my last episode, you know, I don't work for free. And I got really, really positive feedback on this. No, it was, was this on my last episode? Maybe two episodes ago. Um, I got very positive, like, resonant resonance I don't know if that's an English word but positive feedback on this kind of topic however I also want to say there's levels to everything and often I get questions like how do I turn um, gifting into something paid and I think this is maybe this is not a helpful answer but it's the same as asking me like oh how much do you get paid for a post and that's not because I don't want to give you the number but it varies so much because of course there is a brand that I would want to do something for free that is either an independent designer. My friends do not have to pay me. Um, at some point, I think we all want to be in the positions where we pay all of our friends, right? And I, my designer friends also at some point will maybe be in this position, but there's friends that I would do anything for. Fashion is a people's business and um, we all try to support each other in whatever way is possible. And I can do that for free because other brands are paying me. So there's, um, independent brands you know like my friend that's a designer I'm not gonna like ask them to pay me I can give an example like I I maybe I see, seem too much of a fan of Peter but I'm a fan almost even more than I am a friend I'm a fan this is someone I want to support and for me to just you know text him and go to a studio in Brooklyn and pick out whatever I want uh, to borrow for like events in New York and the Met Press preview, that to me is a privilege, you know, I to have a designer that does the most fantastic things and I just get to text them, even though they're my friend, but I just get to text him and ask for whatever I want and I get to a studio and there's like a rack prepared for me, you know, like this is not, this is not a person that has to pay me to wear Peter Doe. I love his designs. So I think there's levels to everything and I'm not going to ask an independent designer to pay me. However, there's also luxury brands that simply do not pay. Some brands say we don't pay and it's a lie. Like 
you know, influences also talk between, between them. Um, I know a lot of them have a cap number. Uh, I know for a few luxury, luxury, luxury brands, for example, that is 5K. That is a lot of money, but you know, for girls that usually get like 80K per post, it's not a lot, but this is often a brand that is very beneficial for your image. So they are brands, if you're attached to them, it benefits you. For me, it benefits me being attached to Magella. It benefits me being attached to Dior. It benefits me going to a Chanel couture show. Like there are things that elevate my image. And then there are brands that pay a lot. These might be commercial brands. These might, these might be people that at these brands that want to support you. Um, these might also be luxury brands that benefit your image, but they just want to pay and they have budget. So it's not just like, oh, the shitty brands have to pay you. There's a lot of amazing brands that pay, but I cannot tell you um, what's my Instagram price because it varies. That's the part of the strategy. What will you do for free? What benefits your image? Um, who do you want to support for free? And who do you know has, biz has budget that will get you somewhere? And usually I would say, I don't go anywhere for free accommodation. That being said, I just went for free to an old jewelry show because no one fucking gets invited there. Like this is a huge honor for me and something that I want to do. But generally speaking, um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last episode, but for example, um, Meta offered to fly me to New York um, and put me to uh, up in like, I don't know, like some really amazing hotel. And I declined because the deliverables were crazy. And I would rather give that to someone who's grateful for free flights. And that to me is a commercial brand. Like I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing that. So um, there's no clear answer of what I do for free and what I don't. So, I, but in general speaking, would be I don't work for free and I don't work for um, travel and accommodation. But then, yeah, I I don't want to be a hypocrite here. I am a hypocrite. <laughs> There's levels to everything and everything with nuance and there's brands that really benefit you. There's also someone that you're friends with. There's also, I don't know. So I have the privilege of getting to pick and choose at this point in my career. And there's people that I wanna see thrive. And of course I will do stuff for them that I wouldn't do for someone else. That is personal relations. And um, I don't really get like outrageous emails where I'm offended anymore a lot, you know, so I don't get, I used to get these emails like, here's this brand we want to gift you in exchange for posting. I don't really get these kinds of emails anymore because I also, I'm very outspoken, like that's not the way to approach me, you know? Mm. So I have, I rarely accept gifting because I don't need more stuff. Also, I really want to make sure, and this is going to sound like so like fake, but I really want to make sure that I only have things in my house and I'm only wearing things that I want to promote to my audience. Um, I only ex accept, I tell myself, and I hope that it's true, but I hope that I only accept gifting of things that I would buy myself, because otherwise, what's the point? And um, everyone has followers now and everyone has a blue check and everyone is so popular, but I think a lot of people would also promote whatever if it's for free. And that is not how I want to work. So whenever I get approached for gifting and there's like nothing that I like, I just say simply say no. I would not accept anything in my house. I also think no shade to anyone, but making a living out of selling samples, you know, I don't know. I, to me, maybe this sounds like so like sucking up to the brands, but like getting gifted from like major like LVMH brands to me is like the biggest honor. Why like reselling things for like this little bit of a profit? I don't know. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I'm very, very blessed to get these offered. Um, declining things. This can be really, really awkward. Um, I can give you one example for um, where I never heard back from the brand ever again. This is like two years ago, so I'm, this is not like new tea. Um, I got gifted by Balenciaga, I think maybe two times. I got a bag and something else and it was really cute and I posted it and it was for free. You know, I didn't get paid. And then at some point they reached out and said, we have something for Brenda. And at this point, I was already in my era where I do not accept surprises. So I want to see an image of what you're sending to me to make sure that I like it and I feel comfortable promoting it or wearing it. And so I replied, um, can you send me a picture? And they replied, 
I don't know the exact words, but kind of like, no, we can't, but we're very sure you'll love it. Um, if I had any backbone, I would have said, I'm really sorry, but I can't accept surprises as I'm trying to make sure that I like it. But no, Balenciaga was really popping in that moment of time. So I was like, it's a gift from Balenciaga, like I should accept it. And then the gift got to my house and it is something that I would never wear and that I still wouldn't wear. And in this moment, I, you know, I talked to my, to my manager and I was like, I really don't like this and I don't feel comfortable ever sharing this because with the least disrespect, but it's so um, not good looking that it would have looked like a joke. Like, this is not something I can post. I'm, I'm like, I can't. And my, my manager was like, I know you and you're very impulsive. Like, can you sleep a night on it? And I didn't, obviously. I replied to the Balenciaga team. I don't know what the words were, but I, I said in the most polite way, like, I'm such a fan of what you're doing, but I don't, I cannot, this is not something I want to show. Um, can I send it back? And they replied with like a one-liner, like, we'll pick it up tomorrow morning. And they did. Um, FedEx picked it up. And I felt good about it, but in full transparency, I never heard back from Balenciaga ever again. And of course, I don't know if it's, if that was offensive to them or if I just no longer fit the vibe, you know? Like this can be taken personally or can, like sometimes people, things are not as deep, you know? Sometimes it's really when you're getting declined for something, it's just, it's not like someone hates you, it's just you weren't a fit for this thing. So um, there is obviously a risk of saying no to things. And um, I, like this year, for example, I heard from Prada for the first time, which is like my ultimate, like I really want to, not ultimate goal, but like I really want to work with them. I'm such a fan. I'm a huge mutual fan. And they reached out for their first gifting of a bag. And it is one of the bags that was promoted on all the influencers pages. Um, and I don't like it, to be quite, like it is not, I don't think this brand, this bag is desirable. It's like one of the nylon things. Also, it had, it had golden hardware. And I have a very strict guideline of my aesthetics and it did not fit that. So of course I have a moment where I'm like, if I decline this now, they might never reach out to me again. And that is a risk. But I, I, at this point I want to really, you know, like five years ago, obviously I would have accepted this as a, a small creator. I'm still a, a small creator, but you know, now I really stand for a certain aesthetic. and. It is not something that I wanted to promote. And a gift is never a gift. You know, a gift from these like big brands, they, they're obviously hoping that you will post it. And that is then maybe attached to, you can really turn a gift into a long standing relationship. It's posting the thing, then maybe at some point posting something else. And at some point, maybe it gets to be a paid bag activation. And then maybe at some point you get invited to the show. And um, I could have really fucked it up for myself now, but I hope, it was worded in a friendly way and that at some point maybe I will get to be attached to this brand. But if I'm not, then at least I know I'm not promoting anything, any product that I wouldn't buy for myself because this bag I would not have bought. But yeah, it, it's every brand, it varies whether or not you can turn a gifting into something paid and some brands don't pay ever. Some pay brands like these luxury brands only pay when it comes to beauty. Mm. So it really depends. So I think if you're in the position where you can say no, then I would always say no. But I have to say, even about myself, I don't know if I'm in the position to say no to someone like Prada because I don't know if this, um, whoever is in the PR is thinking, oh my God, she's so arrogant. She's not accepting a gift. Like we will never invite her. I don't know if that's the case. Maybe someone is also like, wow, good on her for like only promoting products that she likes. But I, yeah, I, you never know. Like you can never be sure of yourself. I just got um, offered, I just got offered a three month free membership of like the most amazing gym in Berlin. Like it's so beautiful and so beautiful it's designed. And I emailed back um, that I'm usually traveling. So three months free um, membership won't cut it for me. And I never got a reply back. Like some people are so like, wow, who does she think she is? And I'm always trying to make collaborations, whether that's paid or not, beneficial for both sides. 
and I think PRs are also trying to do their best and they're in a time crunch and they're just sometimes like filling in the gaps with certain influences. So when one person really steps out of line and says like, I don't like this, they're like, okay, whatever, like I have to move on. So it's not like someone at the bigger brand has time to always tailor something to me. Yeah, so gifting and whether or not you can, you should accept things, I think it is the most important thing is to be self-aware, like A, knowing your worth, but also knowing your worth in a way of like, is this a little bit too much if I decline it? Um, and I think it's often, you know, playing the game. And I, I hopefully would say I don't regret sometimes not playing the game and saying no, but there's always doubt. So even in my position, you know, I'm not super big. I have something to lose. Um, yeah, it's always a risk, but for me, it's a with risk worth taking. I am so like literally black and white that um, I don't feel comfortable promoting something. But yeah, there's a few brands that never pay. I know that Rick doesn't pay. Um, who else? Yeah, I don't want to like say, it, say, say too much here, but um, also there's influencers that will make something look like it's paid or even crazier will make something look like it's gifted you know like going to a Dior boutique and showing the new lady Dior bag and doing like this whole unboxing and if you have like five million followers it will look like that is gifted but like you can never be sure of whether or not something is paid for that's what I wanted to say um, so don't trust anything. Always be aware. Be like a very informed consumer. Can you hear summer barking? I hope not. Um, yeah, then I got a last question of how to request tickets for Fashion Week. I'm really sorry if you can hear the dog barking. Should I check? Summer! Was machst du? Um, requesting shows for Fashion Week. So I requesting tickets for Fashion Weeks. I don't do that myself. I have a management for that. Um, to create, I can get into this another topic, but to create kind of a layer between me and the brand. And often I don't, they don't request anymore. It's more the brand which is out, will Brenda be in town? And the management says yes, and then uh, there comes the invite. But requesting for a show, I have to say, if you cannot find the contact, this might sound really arrogant, of where to request the show, that is natural selection. Like if you cannot Google a PR contact, even if it's press at brand.com. If you can't even get to that point, then I really think this is not for you. I'm sorry if this sounds really arrogant, but you know, like there's like obvious steps sometimes that you would take. A show request, um, I think the first question is, what value do you bring to the show? Will you write a text for a magazine? Are you a freelance writer? Do you want to request backstage access because you're a photographer and you have a chance of getting these photos into days.com or whatever? Like there has to be some kind of benefit to the brand. Um, if you're an influencer, you know, there's influencers in Germany, you say there's influencers like sand at the sea, like sand corns, sand pieces, sand, what's it called? Sand grains? I don't know. Um, there's a lot of influencers and everyone thinks um, they deserve a spot. But even for me, sometimes I might be a fit for that and sometimes I'm not. So what exactly do you bring? Is your aesthetic aligned with this? Do you have millions of followers on which platform? Like sometimes on TikTok, it is to the brands, not to me, not as worth as much as on Instagram because everyone has millions of TikToks followers, but TikTok videos always get sent out to a completely random audience. So whether that brand is looking for brand awareness, brand awareness, not brand awareness, or converting sales, like you have to um, be able to offer them something, you know, whether you're a writer or a photographer or an influencer, um, it, like there has to be some kind of benefit for, for the brand of what you're bringing, not just like, I wanna go, like that's not enough. So if this is a random PR contact that you don't know, that doesn't know you, you write a nice introduction and who you are and here are my socials and here's like what I'm, bringing to the table, I would say. And this email should not be more than four sentences long. You do not attach like your portfolio, you, you, you attach your socials or whatever you're offering. You say which magazine you're writing for um, and that is it. PR people or whoever is receiving this email, they do not 
open links. They do not open, like, they don't have time. These are very, very, very busy people. I would say the quote unquote less known you are, I don't want to say less important, but like if you don't have a direct contact there, I would personally request the show four weeks before, not six weeks, like no one is working on the like invite list yet, I would say. But um, like the more important you are, if you are Rihanna, y your publicist can call two minutes before the show and say she's coming, like you can get in. If you are an editor in chief, you can say the day before like, oh, by the way, can I come? And like you can come and then the less I would say known you are or less experienced or less known by the brand, um, I would say a month before. So if you want to go to Men's Fashion Week, for example, that would be now. Um, I think overselling yourself, I don't know, I have to say as an editor myself, I get emails from these, especially US managers, um, about featuring their talent in in O32C and I wish sometimes these managers would just be honest like here's my talent she would love to be in the magazine here's what we can do but it's like here is this and she's a superstar and she's blah 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 and I'm reading this whole text and I'm like reading like creative director blah 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 stylist and I'm going on the profile and it's a talent like this is an influencer who sometimes shoots for like uh, hype beast an online feature in the least shady way, but like over promising yourself, you know, PR people are very experienced. They can cut right through the noise. Like just be honest about what you are. And um, I think I'm also talking about like fashion capital F, sh like shows that are on the schedule of the four shows, right? So um, saying like, I'm the creative director and I'm this and I'm this, you can literally just say, I'm a digital creator. Like that is it, you know? or whatever your your job is. So be honest, make it snappy, I would say, be polite. And if you don't have a lot to offer, you can also just say, I'm the biggest fan, I'm happy with standing. If there's any way you could consider me, I would be super grateful, like be humble. I would say I'm PR also, they appreciate someone who is there to support, you know? So be honest and, um, be happy with whatever you're getting and it is not hard to find the PR contacts. I would say don't waste their, waste their time. These are ex like very busy people. Um, don't attach like crazy links. Like whenever someone's doing that to me, like for example, I don't o open like random um, Google Drive links and will download your portfolio and the PRs won't either. So like two, three sentences, introduce yourself. It is obviously best to write like to have a name you know if you can find out someone's PR contact like hi Patrick and not just like dear press team so a personal thing would always be more appreciated and be honest and I think that's how I would request a show ticket yeah that's it good luck to everyone um I feel like I talked oh I didn't look at my watch I don't know how long I talked for um, but yeah, welcome back to Brand Awareness. Thank you so much for listening. I'm kind of back on track now um, with my schedule. I feel like, I don't know when I'm recording the next, next one. I'm going to have a little coffee now. Um, my DMs are working again, so you can always ask me questions. I feel like this, like other than doing, unless I'm feeling super inspired, doing like one big topic, I would rather address like a few things here and there. I think this is a more organic approach. I always love feedback unless it's mean, then I don't. Um, thank you to everyone who's sending me my nice messages. Oh, oh my God. And also now in New York, it was my first time having real life reactions to the podcast. Um, I think I've got within my like four weeks in New York, I got approached at least twice a day on the street by someone who's excited to listen. And I can already feel that the bond is like so much tighter between you and I, which is so, so, so exciting for me. And it's exactly what I wanted. And I'm really yeah, so I'm really, really happy with the feedback and I'm so excited you're excited. Okay, have a great day, everyone, and I love you. And um, yeah, that's it. Bye.